Out of just this warehouse alone, we did over $50 million in sales last year. There's over 30,000 pairs of shoes in here, all of which will be in and out within the next 30 days being sold on platforms like StockX, Goat, and eBay. However, running this business isn't easy. The vast majority of the days are uh, very, very stressful, where I'm going to sleep stressed and I'm waking up stressed. I was counting on that money to be able to pay everyone out. In that moment, I really just couldn't see any way out. In this video, I'm gonna reveal the raw reality of what it takes to run a business like this and share all of the secrets behind this $50 million reselling business. Most of the stuff we're selling is just the random cheaper shoes. Uh, we got some Hoka's up here, random Adidas shoes, a lot of random Adidas shoes, stuff that the average reseller who's selling to stores or selling to consignment can't move or isn't isn't selling. Um, and the, the reason for that is because we're able to get to these shoes and these SKUs in such high volume that it works at scale, right? There's only so many hyped up SKUs that we can go for and try and get, and it's a lot less sustainable, especially if we're trying to buy them at retail. And the way our model works is we're not selling to stores, we're selling on apps. So think, StockX, Goat, eBay, every platform that you can think of, that's what we're selling. So something like this, right? Not a shoe that you can sell to stores, Air Max 270, right? Something like this, maybe paying like 50 bucks, selling it for like 55. They're doing a lot of volume, but right? these are the shoes that the everyday person is wearing. Think about your mom, think about your sister, your cousin, right? What shoes are they wearing? Probably stuff like this. So most of these pairs are coming from retailers, like something like this, we probably bought from just like an online shop. Um, a lot of these pairs are also coming from overseas, from retailers in Asia, in China, right? And so we're having people over there grab them at retail. I take advantage of the price difference and then ship them over here. And then we're, we're selling them on out. So if you look over here, this is all inbound items. So this is just the last three days. All of these packages, all the ones we were showing, and then we're, we're even packed out in the, the back room as well. All of this is just from the last three days. So the flow of the warehouse, the way it works is people will come in, they'll either drop off or the trucks will drop off the packages here. The inbound orders or the inbound units will come in this pile here. And this is essentially placed from oldest to newest. So as new stuff comes in, it gets pushed down this line. Once it sells, that's when our team is going and we're grabbing the shoes from the shelves and then we're sending it to the outbound. We'll wrap them up in pallets here. Um, so if you come over here, you'll see each of these shelves is labeled by location. So this one is Q2K201. Um, this is basically just telling us where the location of the shoe is. And then on the boxes, you'll see these one IDs that I'm mentioning, uh, which basically tells us when we go and we sell the shoe, it'll tell us, okay, that specific shoe is at this location in the warehouse and it belongs to this consigner. And so that way it's tracked throughout the whole process. Right now we're inbounding over a thousand pairs a day, which as you can imagine is a lot of work because we also have to deal with the outbound and actually fulfilling the orders. Right now outbound, we're doing around 1500 outbound units per day. Uh, which again, as you can imagine, is a lot of work on the warehouse team, so they've been doing a great job. The way we determine whether a shoe is a good buy or not is just using our tech. So we'll have people, we'll have a team going on, checking every single SKU on all the different platforms, uh, using some of our sourcing tools, and then they're deciding what's profitable, what's gonna sell well or not. And then it's just about volume, right? And so something like this, uh, or any of these shoes really, and you take any individual shoe, we might actually lose a couple bucks on it, right? It's just about the average when you're doing this much volume. So on a thousand pairs, we'll make on average $5 a pair. That could come out to half of the pairs we're making $10 per pair and half the pairs we're just breaking even. But that average number is all we're caring about, that average 5%. Before I show you how I'm able to sell over a thousand pairs of sneakers every day, I want to take you back to how I started this business with only $20. I've been selling sneakers and doing shoes for nearly a decade now. I started with $20, $20 at a Marshalls. I went, I bought a pair of Hyperdunks and I sold them on eBay and made $30. When I first started out, in high school, I was a busboy at a restaurant and I was basically taking my paychecks, taking all the money I made from that and just throwing it back into sneakers. Some weeks I would put in 40 hour weeks, so full time at the restaurant on top of just normal school, on top of homework and on top of doing the sneakers stuff. So at the time I was probably making from the restaurant like two to three thousand dollars a month, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I had no expenses, right? I was living at home. I was in high school. I didn't have car pants. I didn't have rent. I didn't have to pay for food. So that money was all 100% just going straight back into the sneakers. I think I saw the true potential of sneaker reselling while I was still working at the restaurant. And it's actually why I ended up quitting is because I saw that I could put the same amount of time into sneaker reselling and finally make more than I would at the restaurant job. And I think that's the way it has to be for everyone. I think you don't start out and just 
just be an entrepreneur, right? Or just run the business and not work the nine to five. You wait until you can make more money with the same amount of time with your side hustle, your quote unquote side hustle, your entrepreneurship, your venture, your business, whatever, than you would at your normal nine to five, your normal job. When you're doing this much volume, you need to be selling on all different platforms, right? Otherwise, if you're only selling on, on StockX, then you're only gonna get StockX sales. And in theory, if you're cross-listing across two different platforms, right? And the volume, the demand, the sales are the same on each, your speed of sales should double. So just by listing on StockX and GOAT versus just StockX, we're able to double our speed of sale. Um, and also we can get higher payouts, right? Because maybe this shoe specifically, right? It sells for higher on GOAT than it does for StockX. For whatever reason, the market's not perfect, right? And so we're able to make more money by cross listing and selling on, selling on GOAT. And maybe this one sells better on eBay, right? You get the point. When you start to add in different platforms, five, six platforms, you're getting five to six times the speed of sale and you're also getting the highest payouts. So per month, we're doing around three, four, five million in sales per month. Um, obviously that's not a profit number. Uh, usually we'll, we'll clear around like five, six percent net. So you can do the math on that. Now, as far as how much we're actually spending to run an operation like this, you gotta think rent, right? This is 15,000 square foot warehouse. You got employees, you got insurance, you got utilities, right? You got all the costs to actually run an operation like this. We're spending anywhere between 40 and 50K per month just at this one warehouse. So rent for space like this is between 15 and 20,000. 20K for payroll, and the rest goes to utilities, insurance, all the other things that come with running operation like this. This pile over here, you'll see a bunch of stuff that, well, this is just an empty box. You'll see a bunch of pairs that either just are unsellable, they're used, they didn't pass apps, and for whatever reason, they got returned. This is like the dead inventory pile. Um, and so once a year, we'll probably go through and we'll clear this out. This pile is probably worth around $10,000. Um, but if you think about the time it takes to sell stuff like this, versus just keep doing what we're doing, the time is almost always better spent just continuing to run the operation we're currently running and doing well with, versus having to double back and try and sell some of this dead inventory. Oh. <laughs> I need a sec, sorry. I need a sec, I need a sec. Oh my God. No. So after high school, I got accepted into NYU Stern, which was really exciting. I actually, honestly, I didn't think I would get in. Um, I, I really didn't think I could get into uh, the school, but it was the only school I applied to. I knew I wanted to be in a big city, or at least I, I thought I wanted to be in a big city. Um, I didn't really know why. I just knew I wanted a change, right? I grew up in small town, Massachusetts, not much going on. And so getting out of my comfort zone, getting into a big city, uh, I knew would be a, a big switch. Um, that being said, the summer right before I went to school, I remember talking to my sister and I was like, why in the world would I leave everything I've built here? Which I thought at the time was a lot, right? Why would I leave this all and, and have to start something new, right? At the time the business was doing well, right? I was making uh, probably like five, ten thousand dollars profit per month just with local consignment. And that number kept going up. I had good friends, I had girlfriend, right? I was with my family. Life was good. And so in my mind, I couldn't understand why I would throw all of that behind and just have to start completely fresh. But I remember that the first week I got to New York, it's like it totally just shattered all my beliefs, right? At the time, I thought $10,000 a month, that's all I needed. And, and not to say that's not a lot of money or that's you need more than that. Um, but it, it just being around the type of hustle, the type of energy, the type of money that people had in New York City, right? One of the richest cities in the country, in the, in the, in the world. It totally shattered my belief of, as far as what was possible and how much money is actually out there, right? My roommate freshman year, his dad was a billionaire, right? Before that, billions felt so out of reality. Like it felt like it wasn't even real. It wasn't even something that people actually had. And then all of a sudden, I'm sitting at a table, right? or, or I'm, I'm talking with someone who has a billion dollars, at least is worth a billion dollars. And to me, that totally shattered what I thought was possible. So almost all of the pairs you see behind me are coming from retailers, either US retailers or Asian retailers. So we don't have to worry too much about authenticity. Obviously, we're still checking everything. We're doing QC as products come in. And then there's usually another level of checking once it goes to the apps, right? If we sell someone on StockX, it's going to StockX, they're authenticating, they're verifying. And so even if a small percent of the shoes come back, damage box, whatever. We just factor that into our margin and we just assume that a certain percent will come back to us. Most platforms understand that not 100% of the products that you sell are gonna be perfect, right? 
they're expecting a certain percent to not pass or have to be sent back as well. And they're okay with it. They understand it's a cost of doing business. So as you can imagine, when we're doing this much volume on the platforms, the platforms care about us and they take care of us a little bit more than they would the average person. And so we'll have regular check-ins with our account managers. They'll check in, make sure everything's okay. We can meet with the tech team. We can get support from them. And really support from these platforms is just a text or a call away. We have pretty constant support. Whatever we need, whatever we need help with, they're there to help us. So NYU Stern, right? Uh, I, uh, I really didn't think I was gonna get in. Um, I can't remember what the acceptance rate was, but it was something stupid, like 5%. Um, and, and my grades were good, but I wasn't top of the class. Um, I had good test scores, which helped. But I think the reason why I got on is because of the, the story I told in my application. Basically, the story I told was uh, throughout my life, everyone has always said, oh, like, why are you spending so much time on that? Why, why are you taking it so much seriously? Why are you choosing to do that? They're just shoes, right? And so the essay, the way, the story that it told was, okay, uh, when, I, when I first started out, right, parents won't buy me the expensive shoes that I want, and so I'm forced to go out and get, get it. Um, why do they not want to buy it? Because they're quote unquote just shoes, right? And then you get to high school and people are like, okay, why are you spending so much time like on social media, whatever, they're just shoes. And it's time and time again, right? Why am I focusing on it? Why, why did I drop out of school, right? Why is that my, my main focus? We've been trying to prove that they're more than just shoes, right? And that's just been the, the story like throughout my almost entire life now is proving that there are just more than shoes. Um, people don't take you seriously. It's, uh, it's almost like a joke, not just the reselling side, but sneakers specifically. Um, everyone's exactly like that. They're like, why are you doing this? Like, they're just shoes. Like, you can't build a, you can't build a business. You can't build a big business around it. A lot of the business that we or the sellers are doing, buying from other retailers, it's things that anyone can do, right? It's not like we have a direct relationship with Foot Locker where they're giving us the pairs. But for the vast majority of these pairs, they're just being purchased online from retailers the same way everyone can. There's no unique advantage outside of the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. We have the tech and we have the tools to help us. These pairs aren't getting backdoored from online retailers. Um, most of the stuff is just, we're playing by the rules, right? And we're just doing it very well. To be completely honest with you, I think the vast majority of the days are uh, very, very stressful where I'm going to sleep stressed and I'm waking up stressed. Um, you'll get those, those one-off days every once in a while where you have a, a big win or things start to look good. Um, but business is tough, right? And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something uh, and, and, and trying to make it seem easier than it actually is. There's a reason why there's not that many people who have done great and big things, right? There's a reason for it. Um, it's because countless other people have tried and failed. And uh, so you're, yeah, it's a, it's a daily battle, man. So around a year ago, from the time we're recording this, our, our payroll cost was around like 60, 50K a month, right? And when you have that amount of payroll that you have to pay every single month, it puts an immense amount of pressure on you, right? You have people who are depending on you, right? Their, their families, their livelihood, right, is depending on you being able to pay them twice a month, right? And what happened is a week before payroll, right, where you gotta, I gotta pay out, uh, it was bi-weekly, so call it 30K I, I owed to people. Stripe froze our account, meaning all the money, all the sales that we had made was frozen and it, I, I wasn't able to access it. I was counting on that money to be able to pay everyone out. And in that moment, I really just couldn't see any way out. I, I, I thought I wasn't gonna be able to pay everyone out, everyone was gonna quit, and I would have no business, and I would, I would have to go back to, I don't know, moving with my parents, I thought it was all over. Um, so I had a week to really figure, figure out the situation, uh, either to just make another 30K or to figure out how to deal with the, the situation. Um, and when, you're, when your back's against the wall like that, where you really have nowhere to go but, to, but through the problem, right? You can't just avoid it, you can't ignore it. You have to attack it head on, right? And so, and so, we, we, and so we attack the problem with both ways, right? First, we called every single person we knew who worked at Stripe or knew someone who worked at Stripe. We reached out on every platform we could. And on the second level, we tried our damn best to make as much money as we could in that week, right? I think it was like five days we had left. And 
The beauty of having your back against the wall is that it forces you to get scrappy. You, you think of ways to make money and generate new sales and get new customers in ways that you hadn't been, been thinking about before, right? It forces your brain out of desperation to come up with new ideas and innovate and get creative. And so we not only were able to make the 30K ourselves in that five days, but we were also able to get the account uh, un unrestricted and we were able to have access to those funds. Um, and so I think the, the lesson there is that when your back's against the wall, you really can often come with your best ideas. I think, I mean, it either makes or breaks you, right? It could have gone the other way. Um, and there's, there's certainly a luck component to it, but uh, we've had our back against the wall countless times. And somehow, some way, every single time we make it out. And so if you're able to create environments where you work with that same intensity and that same pressure constantly, 24 seven, day in and day out, whether it's healthy or not, that's how you're really able to move quicker than everyone else, right? Pressure creates diamonds. And when we're, we're and when we're, and so if you're willing to take on that pressure, you will get so much more out of it than someone who's just living comfortably. Um, so we have a team of three who are handling all the buying for us. And so I'll walk you through how they do it. And then I'll also walk you through how the average reseller do it. So first, uh, walking through how our team will do it. All right, so on the right, you'll see, and I'm just covering up the left tab because that's uh, it's confidential. This is one of our internal tools. Essentially what it's doing is it's pulling all the stock on different sites. So this one we're looking at right now is Foot Locker. And it's telling us and it's comparing with GOAT and StockX what your profit would be, all right? And so this basically just pulls a list of every single profitable shoe on Foot Locker right now. And then you just click it and it takes you to Foot Locker and you can buy it. So like these Sambas right here, uh, we'd make 25 bucks profit on. Um, a lot of the stuff we're not actually making that much. So you see this one is uh, only $3 profit. And this one we'd, we'd lose money on, this one we'd lose money on. And most of these we're actually gonna lose money. $3, $2 profit. Um, so we're just using this tool. It handles most of the work for us. And then we're just going through buying. It's coming in through our system, getting crossed across all the platforms and then fulfilled. Now, if you don't have access to that tool, there's a few things you can do. Make a site list. So basically all the different major sites or retailers that you'd be buying from. And then what you're doing, there's two things you can do. A, you can go to these sites. You'll see this pop up right here for cashback. Uh, you want to have all the major cashback platforms installed on your computer, installed on Chrome. So when you're sourcing, you're basically just picking whichever one is giving you the most cashback for that site at that given moment. So sometimes you'll see top cashback will be 5%, Rakuten's only 2%, so you obviously want to use the, the top cashback. Okay, so you activate that, and what you're doing now is you're just going to their sales section. Um, specifically, you want to filter to sneakers. And so here we're going to pull up with a list of all of the discounted Nike shoes on this platform right now. This actually is not a bad looking duck. So maybe this is worth checking out, right? I uh, just pulled up the SKU from StockX and then I'm gonna put that into our price search tool on Knet. You just click search right here and it'll pull up with a listing and it'll show you the prices across the different platforms, including your payouts. Um, so you'll be able to compare what you're paying on this platform. So right here, you're paying $63 and you're just seeing if any of these are higher than that. And so you'll see on some of these sizes on the nine and a half and 10, you will sell it for $70 payout and so you'll make a quick five bucks. Um, and some of the sizes just aren't profitable as a whole. Um, so the sizes that are profitable, you can purchase. If you wanna check the sales volume, you can do that on apps. Um, so you're coming over here, you're looking at the market data and then anything that's profitable, you can go ahead and purchase. The money is made not on the individual shoe level. The money is made when you're selling a thousand of those a month, right? Or a couple hundred of those a month. Um, and so that's the reality of the game right now. It's not a perfect business model. Uh, but if you want to make money in sneakers, I think this is the best way to do it right now. We have some pretty big sellers on the platform at this point, people who are doing multiple hundreds of thousand dollars in sales a month. And so even if their their margin is say 5%, they're taking home a pretty good, a pretty good profit. So I can show you the sales on it and you can see how much profit we're actually making. Some of these we're making 20 bucks, five bucks. Uh, sometimes we're losing money. If you're able to work your normal job and you want to do this as a side hustle, this is perfect for you. Uh, we have most of the people who are doing it in the U.S. at least right now. They're they're doing this as a side hustle. We have a, a, a good chunk of whales who are doing this full time and are doing doing very well, pushing big numbers. And we have a lot of users who are doing this on the side. They're in a few groups. They're using some of the tools. They're sourcing in like an hour or two hour break, and they're making a few extra thousand dollars profit per month without having to do any actual quote unquote work. 
People a lot of times will laugh at our margins, right? Five, 10%, let's just use 10% for the sake of the example, right? But what they're not understanding is that we're turning over in our inventory three or four times a month, right? You're comparing that with S&P, which is gonna get, maybe give you 10% for the year, right? If you're doing 10% and you're turning that over every single week, it's 1.1 to the power of 52, which is how many weeks in the year, right? And I promise you, I promise you that number is going to be way higher than just 10% annually. Um, and I think that's like what people get confused. I'm not sure why. They just assume that that's what we're getting for the whole year, uh, even though we're turning over every single week. Let's assume that you're starting with $10,000 in capital, right? And you are only getting 5% margin and you're only turning your inventory over twice a month, right? So call it 26 times during the year. The math on that is 1.05 to the power of 26 times $10,000. That's your return over the course of the year. It comes out to $35,556, right? Versus if you're getting a 10% annually, uh, you're only making $1,000, right? You're left with 11,000 at the end of the year. And so, I mean, you tell me which is which is more. I, I don't think I have to explain yeah. it. But I guess people argue. I you need to put in the work. Passive yeah. income in my mind is a, is a myth. If you re really want to, like true passive income, then you're just not gonna make as much money. And that's the choice you have to make. Do you wanna make more money or do you wanna put in a little bit of work? If you want to put in like an hour of work a day and make however many times more money, in my mind, that's worth it for me at least. I get that a lot, right? People saying you should be in a different market. Why are you wasting your time with sneakers? And what I'll say to that is A, I genuinely love sneakers. And so being able to make money and build a business and build a life around something that I truly love, I think is, is remarkable. And on the second side, I have the biggest competitive advantage in this market versus somewhere else, right? If I were to go into real estate, for example, there's so many people who've been doing it for so many more years than me and have so much more experience, so many relationships, so many connections. Sneakers is a unique thing where I feel like I've been able to, to build a lot of relationships and build a lot of connections and uh, learn a lot to the point where I think this is the market where I have the biggest advantage. And so even if the market as a whole isn't the biggest or the best opportunity, it's where I think I can compete the best. And so that's why I'm in sneakers. I'd rather be the, the biggest fish in this smaller pond than be a, a tiny fish in a bigger pond right now. This is like, whether it's healthy or not, man, I love proving people wrong. Like I, I truly, like it fuels me. Um, if I can wake up in the morning and know that no one believes that I can get it done. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, I've also just had, and I think everyone who, who's building something big has to have a little bit of a delusion, right? Because odds are stacked against you.